and um, the first order of business is the election of the chair. So does anybody wish to nominate someone for the position of chair? Mr. And is there a seconder for that? I'll second that. <laughs> Railroad. <laughs> okay, is there yeah. any other nominations? So then we just need a nomination to, sorry, a, a, a recommendation or a motion to close nominations. I'll move that motion. And is there a seconder? <laughs> and Councillor Revel, do you accept the nomination of chair? I will, thank you. And then we need a nomination for vice chair. Can I nominate myself? Sure, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer for that. I'll second that. I'll second that. And is there any other nominations? So see I'll move nominations be closed. And a seconder for that. And all in favor? Okay. Urban electric position so, unanimously. Councillor Revel, I will turn the meeting <clears throat> over to you. Do you prefer to just stay in your own chair? I'm or did you want I'm, to come up to the head of the I'm comfortable now with some informality with the uh, this committee? I think I'm happy to stay here. So it was an agenda. Um oh sorry, I did not print one. Give me one second. I'll I'll move. I'll move a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. I'll second that. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Disclosure. Disclosures with any disclosure of pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof? Seeing none. Uh, sir, you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> we didn't. Did, I didn't at least receive any minutes from the last me meeting. Whether well, there were no minutes. There were, there. were no minutes. No. no. Okay. There's no last meeting. Really. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm trying to. Uh, you have an agenda? No. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Sure. Uh, we're really. There's only one more item on the agenda for today, Al, and that's the deputation or presentations. And I assume that's going to be the. Uh, Slide projection. Yes. Well, in that yes. case, then I will um, turn it over to Jeanette if you're going to be leading that discussion. Then, so I'm just going to put the presentation up on the screen. This report from the judge in regard to that uh, issue that went to the need to sell the electronic version of down. No, this is the Collingwood inquiry. Uh, right. Okay. But that was the result of that, right? Yeah. Colin, Roger Collingwood. I will give it to him. Okay. So. So we're here today, obviously, to um, discuss the comprehensive review of the procedural bylaws. So this was noted um, in December of 2020. Council established this committee to go over a comprehensive review of the procedural uh, bylaws. So we want to make sure that it's a document that all of council is able to understand, that all of council can buy into, and that it works for you because it really is your bylaw. It runs your meeting. Um, and it's much easier for council to buy into the provisions of the bylaw when you're directly involved with it. So for that reason, we opted to uh, go with a review committee. So just to go over a little bit of the history of the procedural bylaw review committee um, and um, 
some of its goals. So it's we're undertaking here a comprehensive review of the procedural bylaw. So best practices have shown that the bylaw should be reviewed during each term of council. So there was a comprehensive uh, review of the bylaw done back in 2013 for the 2011-2014 term of council. Um, and there were some technical amendments that were identified and brought forward in 2014. Then there was a comprehensive review done both in January and October of 2015. The January review was during the new term of council and it brought forward some efficiencies that were identified by staff um, as part of the uh, service delivery review that was produced by KPMG. They encouraged staff to look for efficiencies in all of our processes. So some amendments were brought forward at that time as well. And then of course, this review is going to cover this term of council. So um, you're also, uh, one of your goals is to make recommendations on the Kempsey Front Act procedural bylaw. Um, so the provisions that, sorry, and as well, um, we want to ensure as what was brought forward at the September council meeting, that the findings of the Ombudsman are now brought into our procedural bylaws. So the Ombudsman has found in two separate cases that when you lose a live stream during your meeting, that it is considered a closed meeting, uh, regardless of whether it's in the procedural bylaw or not. So there were some technical issues that we wanted to make sure are included in the bylaw, and those were included in the report that went to council last, last month. And those are the technical issues. If the live stream goes down, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle that? We should identify that in the procedural bylaw. Um, we want to make sure that there's provisions in the procedural bylaw that that live stream is being monitored. Obviously, when we're sitting in the room, I'm not seeing the live stream right now. So we do have somebody monitoring it, but we want to make sure that those types of provisions are brought into the bylaw. And then we also want to provide alternate methods of allowing the public to see our meeting. So currently, um, we only do the Zoom and the live stream. People do have the ability to call in, but the Zoom option is only if you're participating in council. So um, do we want to look at another option? The very first meeting that we had when we were in the pandemic was, it was a teleconference, a telephone, and we live streamed it to our um, Facebook page. So what other options are out there? And then we want to make sure that that's included in the bylaw as well. So, and then the last one there is we're going to end up drafting and submitting a bylaw with processes and procedures, hopefully for council um, approval. So are there any questions on some of those points before we move on? I just want to make sure that- I have a question, Jerry, go ahead. Sorry, excuse me, Chair. Uh, the question is, I didn't realize when we lose uh, live streaming that you said, did I hear you say it becomes a closed meeting right now? No, we are live streaming right now. So there, but if so, we lose that, does that, be, do we, does that become a, a closed session all of a sudden? So what the Ombudsman has found is that if your live stream goes down and you know it goes, or even if you don't know it goes down, if your live stream goes down, and all of a sudden the public is not able to watch your meeting, it's considered a closed meeting because you've now excluded the public. <clears throat> well, do I believe I understand that if council pauses the meeting, yes, then that falls within the, the ombudsman's yes, rule absolutely. until we're able to fix the live stream and then proceed. That's correct. If we carry on the meeting without fixing the live stream, it's considered a closed That's meeting. That's correct. And yes. contrary to the act. So we want to make sure that we have provisions in the bylaw. What do we do? What happens when the live stream goes down? What happens if you know there are technical issues? And we just want to make sure that it's included in the bylaw, so in the procedural bylaw, so that when it does happen, we don't have you know anybody saying let's just continue on. Another question, please. When we're in a public building where the hopefully it will become post pandemic when we're in a public building and the, the public are if we had members of the public in the same room as the council do these same rules apply okay so if, if you don't have a live feed and everybody's well we have a live feed but we also have public in the, on the premises yes that's so cool. these provisions that the Ombudsman has found are really in today's COVID world where 
your meetings were not allowed to, were not able to um, allow the public into. Oh, okay, that's my question. So just a point I might ask members of the committee, I'm quite comfortable if we don't necessarily go through the chair if there's a simple question to ask. If it gets out of order or people are speaking over when some, somebody else I'll intervene, but if, if we're comfortable just asking Jeanette a question or Kelly, I mean, maybe just go ahead without necessarily having to go through a chair to do so, yeah. if that's the wish of the committee. And if everybody's comfortable with that, it's just sure. interesting yeah. and simpler uh, approach. Yeah. I just want to speak if I may. May what may happen, uh, Gary, is that without without us knowing it that the system's gone down, we could actually carry on and pass motions and stuff. And it's considered a closed meeting because we've shut the public out. And you can't really pass motions of action when you're in camera. No, no, you know, my you point give was instructions and stuff. But you misunderstood it. Look, my point was to be an answer. If we're sitting over in the auditorium where there are members of press and public. As, as well as yeah. live stream. That was my question. Yeah. Yeah. So these provisions only really apply when when we're in a situation where we cannot allow the public to be into the building. Right. Okay. Sure. Who's going to determine when it goes down? How do you know when it's down? So currently, right now, we have two people watching the live stream. Yeah. And if it goes down, we would be up. Probably somebody would phone and say, I've lost my connection. <laughs> Yeah. So I'll just go on to the next yeah. one. So the next one is some key facts. So um, Section 238 of the Municipal Act obviously provides the uh, municipality or local board with the um, ability to pass a procedural bylaw for their meetings. Um, but there's very little prescription in the Act. So I have uh, passed a handout to each of Council of what the Act actually states in terms of the procedural bylaw. So really the only thing in there, and I've, I've noted this to council on numerous occasions, is the definition of a committee. So for example, the definition of a committee is when the members, 50% of those members are members of council. So that's why I've always said to council, you can't just say, oh, councillor so-and-so and councillor so-and-so, we're going to let you go off and do this. Because now you've formed a committee, council has appointed two members, you're both members of council, so it's a technical committee. And, and again, keep in mind that, that members of council are answerable to the public. The public elects you, and so you're answerable to them. So what you do has to be open and transparent to the public. So that's a little bit of a difference between members of council and staff. So I always be cognizant that, you know, when councillors want to get together as a group and do something, it is fine. You are able to do that, but it has to be done in an open and transparent process, which means you have to have public meetings open to the public, you have to do minutes and agendas. So just one and two. So that was one of the things that the municipal act does. It actually defines that committee so that um, that can't happen. Um, and then as well, it allows um, uh, your municipality to have um, meetings can be held outside of public offices, but they have to be adjacent to the municipality. So for example, we couldn't technically have a meeting in Napanee because it's not an adjacent municipality. We could have a meeting in the city of Kingston because they're an adjacent municipality to us. If for some reason we want to have a public meeting, say for example, on some of our paramedic services and we want the public to come and be invited to attend, uh, you know, 90% or 80% of the calls are in the city of Kingston. So we may want to consider holding that meeting in the city of Kingston maybe the loser. So we can hold meetings in an adjacent municipality, but we cannot hold a meeting in a further off municipality. And then keep in mind as well, we are the county of Frontenac. So the township of North Frontenac is considered our municipality. So it, it, it doesn't seem adjacent to where we are right now, but it would be considered our municipality. I would assume that that uh, uh, law was brought in because of the uh, Muskoka issue where all the members of Council out there were elected, were proper council or cottage owners, and they all lived in Toronto. So they tried to hold a council meeting in Toronto, uh, ignoring the residents of the town. And that's reacting to that issue. I, I honestly I can't speak to that. I'm not. I I have, I'm not sure why that's brought into being. 
keeping in mind protecting parents. What's that? Protect yeah, parents. So absolutely. Parents. Yeah. yeah. So let's get out of here. We can't hold this meeting. <laughs> Um, so the next point here um, that the County of Pontiac Procedural Bylaw, so it was enacted in 2013, it's composed of 63 pages, and there's a copy on each of your desks, it's the most up-to-date consolidated version, um, and to date it has had 26 amendments to it. So I just wanted to um, go through some key facts on our procedural bylaw. Um, so the comprehensive review that occurred in 2015 or 2013, as I mentioned, there's no committee that was struck for that. It was all done through staff. I would note though that in 2015, staff had asked members of council to provide any comments on the procedure bylaw and where they felt some amendments might be needed. So we did receive some comments from members of council, um, but the, it wasn't an actual committee. So I just want to go through, um, and it's not up on the slide, but I do have some notes here. So I just want to go through some key changes that were made um, during the 2013 review of the um, procedural bylaw. So that is the actual review that established the use of the committee as a whole. So at that point in time, it was felt that council wanted to have an opportunity to more fully discuss in more detail and perhaps get down to the more meat of a report. So they brought forward the opportunity to have the committee of the whole meetings. At that time, we had scheduled one committee of the whole meeting during the month, and then the next month was council. Um, there were amendments that were made to reflect the fact that we are now a paperless municipality. So back in 2012, we started using um, my compass technologies, which allows us to do electronic meeting management. So those uh, amendments were brought into the bylaw to reflect that. The term of office for the warden and deputy warden was changed from four years to one year. Now, of course, they changed the amendment of the uh, procedural bylaw in 2013 to do that. It did not take effect, however, until the following term of council, as per section 20 in this plan. Uh, the order of the business on the agenda was streamlined. So, this is where we, uh, previous to those amendments, all reports were just thrown on the agenda in sort of a mishmash pod. So, uh, that those amendments made us uh, saw changes. We now have a section for recommend reports from the chief administrative officer, which are actually reports that require council to make a decision on in order for staff to proceed. And then we now have a section for just information reports. And information reports are really just for council's information or to let you know what's going on. You're certainly able to ask questions, but there's no requirement for a motion in the report. So previously, those reports all had a motion in them that uh, simply said to receive it, which is a redundant motion. So it sort of streamlined the process by separating those. Um, some of the other things was it provided the ability for staff to provide briefings to council. So previously it was a report. Sometimes there's things that come that don't require a report. For example, you receive the CAO briefing on a monthly basis. It really doesn't require a report. Um, but it does require us to come and speak to you to let you know key things that are happening, as opposed to putting it into an information report where it could get buried. Um, the number of deputations that were able to come to council, that was reduced to three. Previously, there were unlimited deputations that at some council meetings, it was found that they were taking over the entire council meeting because there were so many of them. So council opted to reduce that to three. Um, it added a new section of 24, 25, which was the advisory committee schedule. So previously, can I um, interrupt just for something, please? Yeah. Uh, my question, or my interruption, is because those applications, is there a time limit? There it? is. The time limit is five minutes. Okay. I remember doing that when we did our procedural bylaw. We had to do the same thing because. So many people just run on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there is a time limit on them um, for that purpose. And there is the opportunity in the agenda for the chair to make a call if they feel it needs to go on a little bit further. And of course, council does have the opportunity to um, to raise a point of order and uh, change the it's direction of the chair. Yeah. 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 
presentations? Briefings. Sorry, what was the question? I thought for deputations was 10 minutes. I, it, oh, my apologies. It, could, it was perhaps suggested at five minutes, and council opted to give them 10. Council could only speak for five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they are 10 minutes. So when we went through the review, staff had recommended five. Um, council opted to go with the route of limiting limiting it to three and giving them the 10 minutes. But uh, section two, eighteen six, each step page be limited not more than a total of 10 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then as well, I, I would note as well when, when somebody comes to me to register as a deputation, they are provided with an excerpt of the procedural by the bylaw that uh, Mandate that um, that looks at three deputations, so they are aware that it is a 10 minute. And I would typically ask them, Do you need more than that? Well, did you say they were limited to three? Three deputations per meeting. Bottom is two now, actually. Yeah, the maximum in the bylaw it says the maximum of two deputations may address council per meeting. That's on 18.7. Okay. I mean, it, 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 just a question. See, this is why we're going through this review. That's why we read these so <laughs> carefully. Uh, yeah. Enough data on these things. But each deputation can't have two speakers according to this. Yes. Um, so, and then the next piece that was uh, amended back in 2013 was all of the advisory committees. So previously, when we made appointments to advisory committees, it was done as a separate bylaw, and the actual bylaw that formed the advisory committee was never updated. So what we did back in 2013 when we updated the procedural bylaws is that we now include a Schedule B, and Schedule B is all of the advisory committees, so that we have all of that information all in one place now. So if you're looking for any information on CDAC or the Planning Advisory Committee or this committee, it's all in one place rather than trying to find each separate individual bylaw. Um, and then the other, the other thing that was added as well was the external boards and committees. So we have passed the bylaw each, each council term to appoint people to these certain external boards, such as the library board, the health board, uh, the food policy. So that is now incorporated into the procedural bylaw as well. We also made a major change in that bylaw that anybody who wanted to um, be appointed to an advisory committee, a citizen, they had to be an eligible elector. So previously, um, we could have people applying to sit on our advisory committees that actually worked in Leeds and Grenville, but maybe felt they had some technical expertise to offer. So now anybody who sits on an advisory committee has to be an eligible elector, so basically a county resident or um, rental or neighboring property. Now, would that also include anyone who perhaps owned property in Frontenac County? Sorry, who? If they own property in Frontenac County. An eligible elector. So an eligible elector is you yeah. have to own property in the municipality or you rent property in the municipality or you're the spouse of a person who rents or owns property in the municipality. Yeah. So technically speaking, someone could serve on one of the committees and actually live in Seeley's Bay. If they own property right. in, in yeah. the municipality, yeah. as long as they're an eligible elector. Right. Because they have a vested interest, right? When you own property in the municipality. So that pretty much covers all of our seasonal residents. Yeah. Seasonal residents. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the last amendment that was made back in 2013 was it removed the eligibility for a warden or for a warden to be uh, to sit as a chair or vice chair of a committee, an advisory committee. Um, now, some amendments were made since that time because there are some uh, committees that are specifically made up of the mayor. So, for example, uh, the uh, the performance review committee is specifically made up of mayors. Or another example was the seniors housing task force, where the mayor of the specific municipality was was there, and the committee felt that the mayor should be chairing meetings. 
So there were some exemptions that were put into the procedural bylaw where the mayor could act as chair, but if it's just a regular meeting such as CDAC or um, the Municipal Advisory Committee, uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee, they can't sit as chair. So that was one of the key amendments that were made in that procedural bylaw. So are there any, and of course, some of these may have been changed in 20, 15 as well, but those were some of the key ones that were done in 2013 when the review was done. Right. So it included in this bylaw is all the list of all of the advisory boards or committees that were formed over the years and that sort of thing. When we go through this process, I would assume that if <clears throat> if there's a committee that's of, of no uh, no longer serving, that we would eliminate that from this text. Yes. So if you actually look in your procedural bylaw under Schedule B, there is a note there of the committees that have actually been removed. So if you look at Schedule B2, it, it tells you the committees that have been repealed and when they were repealed. So for example, the trail, sorry, that's on page 44 for quick reference. So for example, the Trails Advisory Committee was repealed in 2015. The Sustainability Advisory Committee was repealed in 2015. Uh, the 150th Anniversary Committee no longer uh, in use as well as the Service Delivery and Organizational Review. So the bylaw does indicate, just so that we always have a reference of those committees, which ones have actually been repealed. Okay. And then one of the other things that the committee or that staff will be asking the committee to go through as well are to look at the existing committees that we have and are they still serving their useful purpose? Do they do we need to make some changes on that? Some of them are legislated, such as the Accessibility Advisory Committee or the um, Planning Advisory Committee. So we, we they're legislated, so you can't necessarily repeal them, but can they be? maybe brought up to date or had added responsibilities on them. As well, you have the Seniors Housing Task Force Committee, whose mandate really was to ensure that each municipality gets, um, gets a, a business plan for seniors housing. So they've all had their business plans now. So in actuality, those, those committees can likely be repealed unless council wants to maybe consider does that committee still need to, does it still have a purpose in assisting the townships to actually construct the development? I, I don't know. Those are just some questions that you might want to consider when we get to that section of the. In, in my mind, there are committees that probably haven't met in a long time. And if there was a situation arose where you needed a representative to represent Frontenac County on some meeting of emergencies or whatever, I would assume that through a motion, you could appoint somebody to that role. Yes, yes. These advisory committees are just the advisory committees of council. Right. They're not external committees. Right. For example, I'm looking at the Algonquin Land Claim Municipal Advisory Committee. Well, I was on that from back in 1989, and uh, I haven't heard of anybody meeting on any of that kind of information, but it's still in the procedural bylaw context. <clears throat> so that's an example of what I would that's a hot topic in North Roundback right now. Maybe so. But it's a local municipal thing. Yeah. The province is appointed the counties to be the leading on the province. So, yeah. so okay. it was uh, John Ingalls. So there was that relationship. That's why we appointed John as our best post person. So, um, so then if we look to the 2015 um, updates that were done to the bylaws. So again, as I noted earlier, in January of 2015, we looked to the new council and we looked to the report from KPMG to, to help council sort of streamline some of its processes and as well to build some relationships with council. So some of the um, amendments that were made in 2015 was removed committee of the whole from a separate meeting right into council. So as you know now, we in each council meeting, we rise and meet as committee of the whole. And that gives council the opportunity, just a little bit of opportunity to sort of relax the rules a little bit 
and allows for more meaningful discussion as opposed to having a separate meeting for committee as a whole, because it was found that the, the committee was meeting basically for maybe perhaps one item and it was um, taking up, it required everybody to travel for, for one agenda item. So we just found that the council found that it wasn't really efficient. So we moved it right into the council meeting. That was one of the- um, So now I have a question if I may, that um, you speak of the relaxing the, the rules of your life through the committee as a whole is that I've done all of the bylaws is that identified in the bylaw in terms of ability of council members to speak more than once or twice. So committee as a whole, even though it even though it is all of council, mm -hmm. it's not council. It's a committee. So that. you now fall into section 25 or 26, which identifies oh section 18. So you look to section that's, 18, that's fine. Fine. which yeah. identifies now committees. It's, it's a little bit difficult to grasp because it is all of council sitting at the table, but it's actually a committee, which is why when you're coming out of committee as a whole, that you have to have council pass that resolution that they adopt the, the report of the committee as a whole. Because yes, because if it has to be actually council, they can only make those decisions. Thank you. Um, another thing that was removed from the from the um, council agenda was the account listing. So each month, the council agenda would list out every single check that we issued to every single vendor. Um, so that was removed, and uh, we did prior to removing that, they did have um, recommendations from the auditor. And I can provide the committee with the reports that actually brought forward these amendments if you wanted to see the reasoning behind that. But it was checked with the auditor. And it was felt, you know, for some confidentiality reasons, it's not the greatest practice to list on a public agenda every single check you've written and who you wrote it to. So that was removed. Um, the duties of the deputy warden were now incorporated into the bylaw. And one of those duties, obviously, was that the deputy warden act as the chair of the committee of the whole. Um, and this was done to provide some preliminary training to the deputy warden when they were move up to board in the following year. It saw the establishment of the council liaisons, and this was done in an attempt to um, enhance the council staff relationship. Um, and the council liaisons were to act as that conduit between senior management and, um, and council. So uh, the next thing that was done was council liaisons were also added to the composition of the advisory committee. So if an advisory committee, for example, uh, the committee, uh, CDAC committee reports to the planning and act dev reports to that committee. So the liaison for the planning and act dev was added to that, that committee. Same with the accessibility advisory committee, it falls under corporate services. So the council liaison for corporate services is added to that committee. So those liaisons were added to there. Um, it also provided some integrity commissioner provisions. So we put the definition of what the integrity commissioner actually is into the bottom line. And it added a new section. So the new section that was added was purpose and intent. And that sought to address some of the dysfunctions of the previous term of council. Uh, it laid out equal rights for all of the members in terms of discussions at the meeting, voting rights, uh, debate, and decision-making process. Um, and uh, it called for civility and respect in the council chamber. So that piece was added. It was actually suggested by one of the previous members of council. And again, it was just to, to sort of address the dysfunctions that had happened in the prior term of council. So were there any questions on those ones before we move to the next? You mean I can't come up and call Jerry a bad name here? <laughs> You're going to stop doing that. Maybe I'll just do it. Do you want a printed copy of the next sheet? Pardon? Do you want a printed copy of the next uh, slide? No, I have not No, you have those set of orders. I just need that. I'm in the tree business. <laughs> yeah, I thought there was a motion for papers. <laughs> I hope yeah, my hearing aids went off. <laughs> so, 
So just to talk about some of the effects on stakeholders. So the procedural bylaw affects a number of stakeholders. It affects the public, it affects council itself, it affects the warden, the CAO, the clerk, our other municipalities and the media. So in terms of the public, um, it affects the public in a sense of deputation. So it, it, it addresses how the public can come and actually speak to council. Um, a key way that it affects the public is that the procedural bylaw raise that, uh, lays out our requirements for openness and transparency. It lays out the requirement for when the agendas are put out to the public. It lays out um, when you can add something to the agenda and when you cannot. And again, that's for public transparency because when you throw things onto a council agenda or you decide something's on the agenda, and you've given no prior notice and you throw a motion on there, you've not really given the public an opportunity to participate, to, to come to council as a deputation to speak if it was something that they didn't approve of. So that procedural bylaw really lays out how we can work through a council meeting, what can and can't be added to the agenda on the fly. The ombudsman has even said himself that other business should not be added to the agenda unless it's very minuscule in nature. So for example, under our other business section, it clearly states you can make announcements, but you don't bring forward key business items that need to be voted on, unless it's an, an emergency. So that's how it typically can affect the public. Um, again, in council, this is your bylaw. Do you understand it? Are you sure, you, you know, are you understanding what's happening at meetings? Do you understand that you have an opportunity to speak up if you're not agreeing with something? So it affects um, um, how you follow that procedural bylaw as well. And one of the key points that I do note is to always remember that you are required to follow the procedural bylaw. So the ombudsman not only investigates closed meetings, but they can investigate if somebody feels that council has not followed their procedural bylaw. So always keep that in mind. And then, of course, um, you know, it affects the warden. It sets out the duties of the warden as per the Municipal Act, but are there other duties that council feels the warden should be taking on or not taking on? So it affects the warden. Is he able to control the meeting? Does he have options when it's getting out of hand? Um, and then for the chief administrative officer and clerk, um, you know, again, as staff, we are your advisors. We are here to provide the best advice that we possibly can. It's up to council whether you take that advice. We have no ability to tell you what you can and can't do. We can only advise you. And um, I think maybe I'm going to ask Kelly to speak a little bit on this one as well, because there are some significant issues in terms of staff. Yeah, thanks, Jen. I think uh, uh, we passed out the uh, uh, Justice Morocco decision with respect or report with respect to um, the city of Collingwood. And there are a number of recommendations in there that will have both procedural bylaw implications and your code of conduct bylaw uh, implications. And the full report's 973 pages. I don't think it's, it's worthwhile reading the whole thing, but the executive summary is there. Uh, so, for example, within that, uh, Justice Morocco recommends that the town of Collingwood which is set out in a, in a bylaw its expectations concerning the mayor, read for us, warden. Specifically, it should provide that the mayor demonstrates leadership to council members regarding compliance with ethical policies and codes of conduct. So there are a number of recommendations uh, in Justice Morocco's report. The province is currently doing public consultation on the report and will be doing amendments to the Municipal Act to reflect some of Justice Morocco's recommendations. And just to give you context, when Justice Morocco finished this report, they immediately moved him into doing the long-term care report. So the province clearly has high regard for Justice Morocco. Now, some of the things in there, I suspect, aren't going to make it through the process. Um, but obviously, if you read through it, you know, one of the key messages is openness and transparency and, and setting out expectations uh, for, for elected officials and for staff. So, for example, when, when uh, Jeanette and I reviewed this. We made amendments. Or we suggested to council amendments to the CAO um, performance appraisal committee requiring me to declare I'm uh, teaching a night course. Um, I'm part of the Eastern Ontario Leadership Council and I work with outside companies uh, with respect to 
uh, investments in Eastern Ontario. So I've declared those things. My daughter works at Queen's University. So I would never sign a contract um, with Laurentian University or St. Lawrence College or Queen's University uh, because of those conflicts. So clearly there's going to be changes coming as a result of Justice Morocco. But I think the general message is our advice would be if there is a decision to be made whether to make things more open and transparent or more restrictive and closed to probably fail on the other side and make them more open and transparent. It's clear that the province is, is going to be pushing more openness and transparency. And if there is an issue that this committee doesn't feel comfortable with in terms of, you know, is that legal, is that required? Um, certainly, you know, we could request a legal opinion and you could receive legal guidance in, in, in your deliberations. So, uh, and as Jeanette said, this is your bylaw. We're just here to, to help you through the process at this point. Uh, one of the things that I've felt, like for example, the issue you're talking about, possible conflict, very few people actually understand that they can still be in conflict after they leave office for up to what, one year, I think it is? That if you took a position, if I left as a council front at county, then I turned around and came back here and applied for a position, uh, say, Paramount Home or that I could actually be in conflict for up to a year after I leave? Am I correct in interpreting that? Oh, oh right. yeah, I, I haven't read the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act in a while, they would admit. But, uh, we'll have object. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so just, you know, the, the key points there is, is to keep in mind that, you know, you're elected by the public, you serve, we all serve the public, not just council staff as well, we all serve the public, that's what we're here for. So we just want to make sure that, um, you know, that we understand that everything we do has an effect on the public, and are we putting the public's best interest in when we make some amendments, and, and maybe we want to look at the procedural bylaw, and provide more opportunity for the public uh, to participate. One of the key things about the advisory committees is, again, those rules are laxed a little bit. It allows for more public participation. The only public participation that's permitted at council is if somebody actually registers as a deputation. So council may want to look at, you know, are there more reports that should be vetted through an advisory committee before they come to us so that that public participation is happening. And, and another great thing that council approved through the municipal modernization fund course a couple of years ago that we've been able to do is um, have the engaged front act website up now. So, you know, council may have some ideas when you're looking at reports that are on a council agenda. You know, questions that say, has this been put on a project on our engaged front next step? Have we had the public input? Have we had the public, have they had an opportunity to consult on this? So there's a number of things that we do out here to make sure that the public is being heard and that their best interests are being served. But these are just some of the things that, that council may want to look at as well. And that may fall in terms of under the section 18 under committees. Do we want to make some additional amendments there to give greater public transparency and greater ability for the public to participate? It's, Bill, it's up to six years from the alleged incident. So if you were in conflict today, Five years and 364 days later, you were still alive. How many years, sorry? Five years and 364 days. So on the sixth anniversary, you can't be prosecuted. But yeah, it does go year. past the term. That, that sounds like two years less a day. So. <laughs> <laughs> So just to look at some committee goals, and I, I didn't really. Uh, so you know, what are the what are the goals here? I, I, and these are my thoughts only. So council may have some additional thoughts as well. So what are some of the revisions that we may want to include in the bylaw? Are going through it? Are there some ways where we can simplify some of the provisions? You know, where we're not jumping through so many hoops. Is the language understandable? You know, I mean. Always remember that the language has to be set in such a way that it's going to hold up if you're brought into a court of law. So you you have to make sure it's not wishy-washy, but is it understandable? And, and can we maybe um, change some of the language that we use? 
Uh, is it too prescriptive? Do we want to reduce some of that? Do we want to um, allow more ability in committees, for example, to make better decisions? Um, facilitate faster decision making. You know, is is so one of the things that has the potential to slow the decision making down is when things go through a committee first, right? So you have to make sure that the committee is scheduled in such a way that it's going to get a council meeting. And does that slow down the process? So are there some things that you feel should come directly to council as opposed to a committee? Um, does it reflect the legislative <coughs> requirements? So as staff, we do keep a very good handle on all of the legislation that comes down in terms of um, the Municipal Act and what needs to be in your procedure bylaw. We've seen a number of amendments over the years. Bill 8, which saw changes in terms of the Ombudsman, we saw Bill 68, which came a few years ago. We see the recent bill that allowed us to put electronic provisions into our bylaw. You know, so are we meeting those legislative requirements? And you know, council, or sorry, the committee will need to look at those electronic meeting provisions. Um, the province did allow electronic meetings when COVID hit. It then uh, move that a little bit further so that you can now meet electronically all the time. But what type of criteria do you want to put around that? This committee is going to have to maybe think about that. Is it going to be just open that somebody can call and say, well, I really don't want to drive today. I'm just going to zoom in. Or are you going to put criteria around it, whether it's bad weather, whether it's, you know, somebody's on vacation, but they still want to attend, so they're going to zoom in. Um, do we want to make provisions around the alternate members now? Is there a need for alternate members if council can just zoom in if they're halfway across the world? Or can you zoom in if you're halfway across the world? Do you have to be in the country? So these are all sorts of things that I want the committee to think about in terms of best practices on what provisions that you're going to put in the bylaw in terms of electronic meetings. So currently, um, our bylaw states that we're going to keep our electronic provisions until one year after we were out of a declared emergency and not to put our CAO on the spot, but I'm not sure when we're going to actually lift that declared emergency. But once we do, the clock starts ticking on those electronic provisions. So, you know, you have a year to decide. One, is, one of the greatest complaints that I've had, I've 30 years around these tables, and one of the biggest complaints I've always heard from, from council members themselves, and probably CAO is, nobody ever visits this council meeting, right? Past pretty important legislation in the lives of people and the community, and meeting after meeting after meeting, council members and staff, nobody from the public. So I think what electronic option does is it actually does engage the community more. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody can say, well, I own property there and I live in Mississauga and you made a decision to question my property and I couldn't attend the meeting. Well, you can now. Yes, and I believe I, sh I pointed that out to council last year during my business plan and it will certainly be, um, it will certainly be shown again this year about the public participation now that we're live streaming. So we are actually able to go onto our live stream feed and see how many people have actually visited that, um, that meeting. And it's quite high. And I, I, off the top of my head, I think on average 20 some people are viewing a council meeting um, every month. And so keep in mind that when you look at your council meetings, they're not necessarily accessible for a number of reasons. Number one, they're held through the day and most people work. So you, they, they're not able to come to the council meeting. Um, they're held in, in the county offices. So if somebody's in North Frontenac, that's a two hour drive. So it's, it's sort of inaccessible in that respect as well. So there's a number of reasons that sort of make it difficult for people to come and actually physically attend a council meeting. And it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It is just, it is what it is. But the live streaming now allows them to watch the meeting because when the minutes are published, both the municipal act and the procedure bylaw state that we cannot record no or comment in minutes. So all of the discussion that happens, all of the, um, you know, dialogue that takes place that, that really, you know, leads your decision making is not captured in the minutes. The only thing that's captured is that council passed this resolution. Right. 
So it gives the public an opportunity to see the discussion and to see what's happening. So I, I remember a call a few years ago when a councillor had said to me when I had you know put the issue or put the idea in the head of council that we want to start live streaming and we want to start doing this that it was well nobody's interested in us nobody ever comes to our council meetings but that's because they're not always accessible but people are interested in what we do people are interested in the community and the decisions that we make so especially at tax time <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you saw some great comments at the public meeting uh, that we had earlier this month. Typically, we've had people that have come asking for funds for some great projects that they've had in mind, but we've never had residents come and say, this is my concern with, with, with the budget, and this is my concern with the services that you provide, and this is how I'd like to see the services enhanced. So, you know, although hot topics, it's a great opportunity for the public to be part of the process because it is the services we're providing them to them. My position is all a fan, but Kelly back it up on that. Is we we assume that perhaps we might have an exclusive on all the intelligence on the issue that we're actually dealing with, but I dare say there's been opportunities that the public could, could contribute tremendous amount of insight into the issue you're discussing, which has not been thrown on the table in the room. So I think it's an opportunity to engage people that may be in your community that has a tremendous amount to offer, but have not been able to participate for whatever, you're whatever absolutely the right. reason. You're very right, Bill. We're finding now we have a lot of uh, retired professional people in this North country. They're living here full time now, and they have a lot to, a lot to offer. And we have them in every one of our council meetings now coming online, giving their, their two cents worth. Yeah. And it's valuable. Mm -hmm. It really, it truly is. These are these are really intelligent people. Sure. Okay. They have a lot, a lot, a lot to offer. Somebody smarter than Bill? Well, someone might be. <laughs> well, yeah. I would comment that we're going by. So um, again, one of the other goals there is we want to make sure that we're including uh, or reflecting findings and recommendations from the Ontario Ombudsman, and that's more so around. Um, the issues of losing your live stream when we're in, you know, situations such as we're in now. We don't know what the future holds. I mean, we could come out of COVID next month or six months from now, but we don't know what the future holds. Nobody ever anticipated this, and we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we just want to make sure that those provisions are in there, should they ever be needed, and that we're reflecting openness and transparency in the findings of the Ombudsman. And again, those all support accountability and because we are here for the public, we serve the public, and, and the services that we provide for the public. So, and then the next goal I have there is to develop, to develop new processes that would support the new procedure or bylaw, as well as provide effective meeting management. So this could include clear processes. You know, is the process clear right now? I, I, and maybe not so much for council, but does the bylaw indicate the process clear enough that the public understands it when the public comes to us and they say, you know, I want to be a deputation on this. And, you know, there's been a number of times when we've had to say no to a deputation simply because they've been to council a number of times and they, you know, they're just repeating the same thing over and over again and they're not bringing forward the information. So is the process clear, not just for council, but for the public as well and for staff? Um, you know, and one of the processes now is, for example, the council agenda. All agendas go out on a Friday afternoon, whether it's for council the following week or whether it's a committee meeting such as this. Does that work for council? I've heard a number of, um, of councillors say that, you know, it's I'm not getting the agenda soon enough because when I get it on a Friday afternoon, I've lost my entire weekend because I have a 300 page agenda to read for a meeting on. So is that process working for you? Do you want to see the agenda come out, you know, a week ahead of time as opposed to so the, the previous Friday, and again, keep in mind that the further we push those deadlines back, the more difficult it is for staff to get those reports done. And then it, you know, it provides the opportunity or the issue that, you know, some emergency could arise. And then, then what do you do? How do you get things on the agenda at the last minute when an emergency arrives? So is the, clear, is the process clear? And do we want to look at that process and how that works? Um, documented rationale for the process, I think I just made spoke with it that and simplified processes and procedures. So again, they all reflect into 
what's working for council? Are you getting information in a clear manner? Is the public able to understand what's getting in? So, and then the last one, of course, is the next steps. So, obviously, we're going to review the current procedural bylaw. I had suggested section by section. Um, and so, what are the critical elements that must be included in the procedural bylaw? So, I'm hoping that, and I'm going to just cover my notes here because I have developed a little bit of a template that council may want to consider working on. So this just has an example on it, one of the examples that I happen to find in the bylaw. But this is what I'm suggesting, and I would give this to you electronically um, prior to each meeting. So what it is, is it's just a chart. So let's say, for example, um, the committee decides to go and we're going to, we're going to focus on sections one to five for the next meeting. So this would give you an example to go through sections one to five on your own at home. And you can, you know, you would just put in here what section it is you're referring to um, and what the proposed changes that you feel might be needed. And then an explanation of why you feel that's needed. And then I've always left open a spot here for counselors comments. So that way, if you wanna share these electronically prior to the agenda going out, you can put your comments in it and then you can share those comments um at the next meeting so kind of like the agenda notes that you use on iCompass so for example this is just one of the things that I quickly saw when we were going through the bylaw that section one starts out at interpretations but there's nothing there to provide the bylaw with a short title and then with the explanation I've shown there that most statutes the title is quite lengthy so it's if it's a bylaw that's continually or very often referred to, to say the whole title name is, is very difficult. I mean, the title of your procedural bylaw is a, is a four line thing that says a bylaw to govern the proceedings and uh, meetings of counseling committees. And the, it's a quite a long title. I often call it the procedural bylaw, but technically there's nothing in the bylaw that actually gives it that short title. So I thought that was one thing that might, uh, might, um, be added to the bylaw that was just and then council may have its comments um secondly under interpretations one of the other things that i noticed was some definitions that are missing so for example we're missing the definition of counselor and alternate counselor um because now we have the ability to have alternate counselors come to council if a member of council is not able to make it so how do you differentiate between those they are differentiated in the body of the bylaw but there's nothing in the definition section which really clarifies um, what's what. So those are just a couple of, so it was just a template that I was thinking of. So if we, for example, opt to go through a number of sections during the next meeting, kind of like homework. And I, uh, homework, yes. <laughs> but if, if each member of the committee and staff as well, this is staff as well, you know, we set out what sections, how many sections, and some sections may be longer than others. So for example, the interpretation section probably is a two minute job. There's just a couple of things missing here, but then you're going to come to sections that may want some discussion, like as mentioned earlier, eligibility of the work. That may call more discussion than, than others. It, it, you know, you want to look at that. How did it, how did it come to be that only the makers are, are eligible to serve as work? And, you know, I, one of the things that uh, crossed my mind as you're discussing this, and I hear from the committee as well and, and staff, that, that um, it seems logical to me that if we look at a morning that we're going to set aside for this type of discussion, to be as efficient as possible, it would be helpful to make sure that we utilize that period of time. People are driving from significant distances to get here. If we have a half an hour of discussion, if, no, if there's no input on a particular section that we've established as for that day, it seems ineffective to spend only a half an hour on it. Yet, on the other hand, there may be a section where there's a lot of meeting, there's a potentially a lot of discussion. You don't get through it all even in that morning time. How do we have that flexibility to? 
we're going to end up potentially discuss from section one to eight. And we go, we go for the morning if we get through as far as eight, great. If we don't, we pick up from six on to 15 the next day. So there's some opportunity for flexibility. Oh, for sure. sure. And, you know, like perhaps maybe we say at this meeting, we're going to, let's just for homework, we're going to review sections one to five. And we're going to discuss those at the next meeting. And let's say we get through it by quarter after 10. There's nothing to stop you from saying, okay, so let's just go and look through the next section. I mean, that's actually covered in the procedure bylaw we have today. The agenda of the meeting uh, can beyond the time allocated, you can just simply stop and pick it up at the next meeting. That part, yes, but but if we finish too early, what do we do if we're here if we're done at 9 30 or whatever change to that suggests what do we do at that point? It's ineffective for I'd rather be able to go on if we need to rather than limit it to one to five or whatever numbers there are. What used to occur is that if you you just simply get an agreement of the members of the committee, uh, notwithstanding, you may have because we're doing it by Zoom, notwithstanding, there may be somebody online that only wants to hear the discussion around one section. <clears throat> And if you have said that we're doing section one and we finish very quickly, so all of the people are interested in section one, sign off, but and somebody that's interested in section two has not signed off, that may be where you that's what I'm suggesting that maybe as the, in the agenda we say we're going to do one to eight or whatever, knowing that we may well not get to eight. Yeah, this time probably be a better approach. It gives us some flexibility to expand, expand mm -hmm. the, the discussion. Just we have to be careful for our homework that we've done homework yeah. far up ahead to. Uh... And, and keep in mind as well that, um, for example, we've been here for an hour. And I, I thought going through these slides, like there's only what six slides may have only taken 10, 15 minutes, but it's taken an hour, which is great because that shows me that there's interest and there's a lot of discussion going on. And this is this type of discussion is how we all learn to understand what, what the bylaw actually is, is saying or doing. So I, I, I really think that the discussion, even though we may only do a few sections, I think the discussion is key. Uh, you know, there's there's four members on the committee, plus you have two staff members who are going to be looking through, for example, two sections. Let's just throw the number two out there, two sections. I'm going to have my comments. Um, each member is going to have theirs. And then there's discussion back and forth, right? Like Councilor McDonald, you, you promoted this. What were your thoughts behind that? And so the discussion is key as well. I, I don't think it's more so um that you're just going to read it and then i'll attach these to the agenda and then and there, I, I can't see it being no discussion just from what i've seen sure, sure there'll be i'll be constructive uh, opinions or recommendations <clears throat> for changing uh, because some of the i i suspect some of the the terms of this law the bylaw really no longer effective, and, but we have to put something in there to uh, recognize the present. So, that's my opinion, anyway. You know, so there's a, so, so I'm just going to look through it very quickly and, and give you some ideas of what has has popped up in my eyes. Um, just very quickly, when we think perhaps sections one, two, four, or five. They go very quickly because all they are are the definitions, the applications, the meeting locations and times, and the membership on council. So, what discussion is there? But there's issues that I have perhaps seen as staff that may come up. So, for example, the procedural bylaw indicates that the meetings are held here every third Wednesday um, at 9 30, unless by resolution of council. So, there were issues that came up with all of a sudden we lost the auditorium. Where are we going to put the meeting? Like, an issue came up where we had to actually have a resolution of council to move one meeting and then uh Gordon Smith at the time used her exercise her powers under the emergency management act to change the location of a meeting and I can't remember what meeting it was for I honestly can't believe 
we, we used her ability to change the meeting because we didn't have a resolution of council to move it. So these are some of the things where we say, you know, what is the process and do we need to add additional criteria around that? So for example, where it says, they're always held here unless directed by resolution of council. Do you want to perhaps add by resolution of council or at the call of the warden? Is that something we could add? Like, and, and again, my recollection would be coming to the meeting that I would give you specific examples. Here's where we've had the, the need to actually have to move the meeting. The warden was able to use her provisions under the Emergency Act to do it, but if, if, if it was for something else, what would we do? So these are the types of things that require discussion that, that I as a staff member have noted. And again, I'm asking all of, of council, surely you must have, like, are there things that you thought that, well, have we ever said to you, we can't really do that, it's not a procedure problem. So there is discussion to be had. I have always it, it, I don't think it will be as quick as, as what we <laughs> anticipated it to be. But if it is great, what what what, uh, what you say leeway does it give you at the end of the meeting if your adjournment notice where you indicate that the uh, date of the next meeting, where you add a line at the end of that saying, or at the call of the warden. Um, so they they do actually do that for committees. I, I wouldn't recommend the date of the next meeting. So your regular meetings are always identified in your bylaw. Um, that's for public transparency because council is the head of the corporation, your decision is final and you make all the decisions based on what committees have decided. So like committees don't have the ability to make decisions, they can make recommendations to council, but those recommendations are not binding. It's council that has that ultimate decision. So your meetings are regularly scheduled every third Wednesday of the month. There is that ability, as you say, Councillor McDonald, that the warden or any member of council through a petition can call a special meeting. Um, but it's more so not so much the date and time, but you know, like what criteria do you want to put around? And again, this may come back to how the bylaw affects the warden. How much power do you want to give the warden? Do you want to give the warden the ability to, you know, or at the call of the warden if the location is not working for, for whatever reason? There's been times, for example, that um, I think we did it through the summer, but I'm not sure why we did it. I'm sure there was a reason. Oh, I think it might've been our anniversary, but we had moved our council meetings around to each of the townships through the summer months. And is that something we wanna to continue to do moving forward during the summer months when traveling is easy and uh, the weather's nice? Do you wanna say, so during the summer, we want county council to meet once a month in the townships. It provides your townships with the opportunity for your residents to come and see council in person. Do you wanna incorporate that to the bylaw? And again, when we did it last time, we had to wait because we needed a resolution of council to actually move the meeting. So it's just, they're just thoughts I'm throwing out there. But again, these are things you wanna think about when, you, when you're looking at the procedure of bylaw to remember that this is the bylaw that tells you what you can and can't do in your council meetings. It tells you how your council meetings are to be done. It puts criteria around where they are, who can come. So is it working? So these are sort of some of the things that you may want to look at when you're going through the bylaw. Lots to cover, I'm sure. There, it's an interesting yes, discussion. So, and, and again, this was why we opted to go through the committee, because I can give all of these explanations for what I'm seeing as staff, but your eyes look at it differently. Your eyes look at it, I see this as how this, how I can do things, but your eyes look at it differently. And it's your eyes may be looking at it as how is this holding me up as a counselor? Or how is this prohibiting me as a counselor from doing my job? So it's a different look at the bylaw through different eyes. So when we go back to next steps, so, you know, so, um, I'm just wondering how, how the committee would like to. This was just my thought that we could, you know, each of us look, you know, and, and it could be, you know, several sections. You may opt to say, well, let's let's focus next month on sections one to five, 
but always read ahead to section 10 just in case. How many sections are we dealing with in the regular? Mm -hmm. so what sort of time and should we be looking at it? So there are 29 sections mm -hmm. in the Bible. Sorry, 30 sections. So if we look at five, if even if we just look arbitrarily at five sections a meeting. If you're looking at probably six meetings as a very minimum to try to work through this. Yeah, and like I say, some meetings can some sections can take much longer than others. So I anticipate mm -hmm. that your section on you know that's going to require quite a bit of thought is how you want to look at electronic meetings moving forward outside of the pandemic. I, I suspect that's going to take a lot of discussion. You know, and I'm glad that we have representation here from each township because you know Councillor Councillor Martin travels a lot further than, for example, Councillor Bevel. So you know, when when it's a snowy day, is it worth Councillor Martin risking his life to come into the? Um, would we, for example, I just looking on the first section here, uh, holidays? Would we? Have to add in things like uh, the federal government recognizing Aboriginal Day on September the thirtieth. Uh, that's that's that's, oh. that's, um, that's a different type of holiday in a sense that it's just a federal holiday. So right now it's not a provincial holiday. So we are still. Well, that's what I, what I was asking yeah. for. But I made a note of that when I was reading through here. Is that were there other holidays that were recognized and will be at some point? have to recognize other special days given the ethnic makeup of our community as it's changing. And, and keep in mind as well, we here at the county will certainly be recognizing the day. We're, we're going to be here at work, but we will certainly be recognizing the day. So. Yeah. So yeah, the thing you gave us a piece of paper here this morning in regard to bylaws, and several of these bylaws have been repealed I see bylaw 2011-22 bylaw to establish joint accessibility advisory committee is being appealed. Was that reinstated at some point? Did this we appeal this one but replaced it? So there's there's two options to do this. My my recommendation would be that we're going to pass a whole new bylaw. So the minute you pass a whole new bylaw, all of the amended amending bylaws would be not included. You're just passing a whole new bylaw. The reason that they are listed in this bylaw is because this is the actual bylaw 2013-0020, and it's a consolidated copy, which means it's a bylaw that's been consolidated with all of the amendments that have been made to it. Once you pass a whole new bylaw, it's a whole new bylaw. So I would suggest we're going to pass a whole new bylaw as opposed to a bylaw that's going to further amend this one. So those all those amendments would be incorporated into the bylaws. Yes, yeah, I, I understand that. But my question is, was this just for information, or did that actually happen? Where in uh, bylaw 2013-2020. So this is a consolidated copy of the bylaw. So when you see all of these bylaws here on page two, these are all bylaws that were passed by council that amended the bylaw. So they have to be included in a consolidated copy so that you know, because the original bylaw that signed didn't incorporate any of these bylaws. So this is what we call a consolidated bylaw. This is a consolidation of all of the amendments that have been made to it. So these bylaws all were passed by council at some point in time, and they're incorporated into the bylaw. So what you have is a consolidated copy. And what I do with a consolidated bylaw is I always show you, so for example, if you flip to page 23, um, where there's a section that has been amended, I note the amending bylaw and when it was passed. So you see in brackets here, this section 12.2 amended by bylaw 2015-0044, which was passed by council October 21, 2015. So that we have a bylaw that we know where we're getting authority from. So you need those bylaws in here to show that we've been given authority to make all these changes. That was question. No. Oh, His sorry. The question was what happened to the accessibility committee? What happened to it? Yes, there's a bylaw to repeal. 
that's the point I was asking. So it was repassed. So that's when we repealed the Accessibility Committee, we repealed re 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 bylaws for certain committees, because if you remember when I told you at the beginning, committees all had their own separate bylaw. So if I was looking for this committee or that committee, I'd have to go and try and find the bylaw. So we repealed all of those bylaws and it was passed, it was repassed when as we consolidated this one as a multiple pass. Right. Yes. Oh, Sorry. Right. That's that's what my I don't hear very well. Well, that, that's okay. I understand that. The reason that I asked the question, because all of the other ones on there that were repealed probably stayed repealed. So all the committees were repealed, and then the only ones that were added back on were the existing committees. So if you go to page to schedule B2, and I think I mentioned right. this earlier, yeah, it I shows think. you the ones that are totally repealed. Right. Okay. And then it shows you the ones that continue on because they okay. have their own schedule. Like I, two, I, get, three. I follow. So I guess where I'd like to go now is from the committee standpoint and the staff perspective. What sort of meeting frequency are we looking at? The monthly basis is that a reasonable um, objective? I, I'll ask the further question to your question: Is that what's the time frame in which we hope to be able to present this back to council? So I would, from my perspective, I would want the final copy presented to and passed by council before August. 19th, 17th, 19th, nominations day, because everybody who goes to run for council next year um, in, in your municipality that is a mayor, running for mayor, or hope to get an alternate seat, has all the information that they need on county council. So if this bylaw is passed by nominations day, we can include it in the packages that we provide to the townships on the information on county council that potential candidates uh, may want to know. Okay. So if we were to look at monthly meetings, we may not meet in December, we're probably looking at April to work through most of the violence. We're looking at roughly five sections a meeting and we meet once monthly. And six months. So that would be roughly six months to, to do that. And we skip December we're in April. Um, I would feel comfortable with that because all the other going on once once a month yeah. but presumably there will be some staff time associated with this work as well does that seem reasonable to you to do yeah. a monthly basis that's what i was hoping for in a, a monthly meeting and then i'm also anticipating and you know that could be based on our discussion here that when we actually take the full bylaw to council and i would have a sheet that explains to council here's all the amendments that were made Here's the discussion that was behind them. Here's the philosophy. Um, and uh, so that, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure this will council itself want to go, you know, through all those amendments and an explanation of all those amendments. That would be just a one meeting. No, no, that would be just one meeting. But, um, you know, will it take a whole council meeting? It, it's, it's, it's an important piece of legislation for council because it is your bylaw and it does have to work for you and you do have to buy into it. All of council has to buy into it because it is your bylaw. So it's not something that I would just want to put on the council floor and, and council say, well, the committee felt it's good, I'm good with it, let's pass it. I really would you know, like to see some discussion and make sure the council understands it and understands why. So the county council meets in July but not August. But not August. So we would, assuming we were to complete our work with a recommendation for council in April, as an example, if typically if we're meeting towards the end of the month as we are now, they would be coming forward to council in May for their consideration. All members of council, if we're doing a special meeting in May, in passage in June, it gives passage in June or and or July. But that's so it's a fairly tight time schedule. If we don't need our getting our work done by the end of April, there's certainly some pressure on county council to pass this by the date in August. So 
I think that sets the time frame up fairly well. We must complete our work by April. I suspect that, Mr. Chair, that we're probably looking at going through this in less than five meetings. I yeah. hear the, the discussions that you have, and comments that you bring forward, and things that I've had necessarily thought about. And I think, as Jeanette points out, there will be opportunities for lots of discussion and debate and consideration on, on matters. Uh, I don't know either. It may turn out it runs fairly smoothly and we, we're done ahead of time, but uh, there may be also things that uh, need further information on or yeah. further discussion. So, but I think let's start out if we're looking at a monthly meeting schedule. Um, is this the fourth Wednesday of the month? Would this time suit most members? For me, I think it's fairly. Maybe the twenty seventh of October. So when we cover, uh, we talk about one to five, but would we actually be prepared for one to eight or something like? I that? think that makes sense, um, Bruce. So that uh, if we do finish what we anticipate a little earlier that members have had the opportunity to look ahead a bit and uh, we can productively move forward a bit. And, uh, and we may find we're gonna go faster in some sections and slower in others. So um, I just think we need to have some flexibility or ability to be flexible. And the other option as well is, you know, for the, the first meeting that we have, um, go through, you know, on all the time, between now and the next meeting, you go through the entire bylaw. It is 63 pages. I know that could be daunting, but just quick, just quick thoughts, you know, get your get your sheet of paper out and just go through the definition. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, some quick thoughts on this, quick thoughts on this, so that you know at our next meeting we have a sheet that's done with the entire bylaw for each of us. And then at each meeting, you can say, okay, so we're gonna set a time limit from 9 to 11 or 9 to 11 30. And we're going to go through section by section. Here's so and so's comments. Here's so and so's. Here's what the bylaw is saying. Um, you know, what types of recommends do we want to support these, not support these? Is there something that we've missed? And that way you have a sheet in front of you that gives some preliminary initial thoughts, but it allows you free range to just set your meetings at two, two and a half hours, and you're just going to go through the. There's that opportunity as, as well. It's just a lot of homework for you. Well, we're going to go through it sooner or later. I yeah. I've gone through two thirds of it or a third of it, half of it. And so I can provide this to the committee members electronically so that you can just type your, your thoughts in or um, what you want to. My thoughts are all on the side of paper as I've been reading. Question, if I may, to you, Mr. Chair, in regard to this definition. If a motion's tabled, Whoever wants to answer this. Does it mean, is it necessary that that motion has to be dealt with within the term of council? It cannot remain tabled indefinitely. Am I correct in understanding it that way? Well, I don't have my Roberts rules in front of me, but I think anything can be tabled indefinitely or postponed indefinitely, and then it just dies. If, if council doesn't deal with it this term. Now that being said, I would I would note to council that I keep what I call an abeyance list in our report listing. So each time council, for example, postpones a motion or tables a motion, I'm not saying the tables one yet, but each time, or you bring forward a motion that you say you want staff to report back on this or this. I actually have an abeyance list which senior leadership goes through um, on a regular basis to make sure that we're addressing these and uh, would have been the last term of council. So I had actually brought that abeyance list to council through a report to say, these are the things that council had directed or whatever through the term. These are what's left over. Here's how they've been dealt with. And these are the ones remaining. And then it's up to you. What do you want to do with them? Do you want to just permanently remove them? Or So we have done that in the past, if that helps at all. Well, that 
generally motion that's deferred or postponed is what the time is. So you can defer a motion to the for consideration of the next meeting, for example, pending report. Something that's tabled requires a motion of council to bring it back off the table. So if that motion doesn't happen, then it does. So if you want something to come back, you're better off deferring or postponing with the time limit than tabling, which requires another motion that you may not get a you know you get a second second. Yeah. yeah. I, I just because it, there's um, motions to table here within the description. And maybe that's um Maybe that's a key thing that I can bring forward when we get to that section is, you know, what are all these motions? Do you have a whole slew of motions? What happens to them? What, what, where are these? So we, I, I don't have my Robert's rules with me right now, but I, I can give a little bit of an explanation of, I mean, it gives it some way in the bylaw, what's debatable, what's not debatable, and when it can be passed, and when it's a motion, and when you need the floor. Yes. But, you know, sometimes, Having that and, and reading it from Robert's rules that explains to you specific motions like that and how they work. I mean, one of the other things on the motions there, you know, just as a, and again, it's from a staff perspective because we deal with it on a daily basis. There's motions there that need to be removed. So, for example, there's a, there's a, a section in there under motions that motions that come back from LPAC do not need to go through the reconsideration process. Well, that's now redundant because there is no longer an LPAC and no longer come back to us. So those are things that need to be, from a staff perspective, we would bring forward to you and say, this needs to come out and this is why. I know we're also in the motion to defer it is debatable. It is, but Robert's rule says there is it, that we shouldn't be using motion to defer, it should be motion to postpone. Which is how I've noted it for council minutes. And it was debated. We asked that question of council. Yes, we did. I'll see the answer here. Good. Well, unless there's any further discussion or moving forward, then uh, let's uh, wait for a motion to adjourn. We have set the date so we for fourth Wednesday each. Fourth Wednesday at 9 o'clock? It, it is, yes. And is there anything else that you need to do? Fourth, isn't it? The fourth? Yeah, it's 27th. That's the fourth. We, have, we already picked that date, if I remember correctly. 27th of uh, October for our next meeting, nine yes. o'clock. And fourth Wednesday there and thereafter. Yes. Because when we were discussing it yesterday, yesterday accessibility, because we. Except at December. Yeah, we just. The 24th of November <laughs> would be the, the next meeting. Merry yeah. Christmas. <laughs> That's after hunting season, so I'm free. Uh, they'll still give us a notification. I'm sorry? They'll still give us a notification. Yes. Oh, yes. yes, for sure, for sure. And I'll follow up after this meeting and provide all of council with this sort of um, sheet that you can pop in all of your thoughts and what you think is changing, what's working, what's not working. And even if it's a section that you don't think needs amending, but under comments, you may want to just put, uh, you know, I need this explained to me in better detail at the meeting. Anything that you want to so that you don't forget. So I'll forward that out to council or sorry to the committee. And then, yeah, if we want to just go through, you know, the whole bylaw or as much as possible. And that way, when we come to the next meeting, we're just going to sit down and we're going to start crunching and we're going to go through the sections based on everyone's comments. And we'll hold the meeting. So, another question then, perhaps for the committee, if we're going to go that route, how long did you want your meetings? Just two and a half hours worth, two hours? What were you thinking? Nine to one, sorry. Two hours. Sue, I mean, I don't know. Bruce, you catch ferry, so I don't know whether it's uh, one time works better for you or not. No, it's not on the schedule. Yeah, oh, yes, for you, it's not a problem. It's the wolf line. Does that give us enough time? Two hours, or I don't, I'm flexible. Like, once I leave home and come down here, my day is shot, so I don't care. So, I mean, yeah. I'm fine to make it three hours if it if the committee wants to go that one, I'm going to leave it up to you. I just well, a lot of the meeting determines on what we're scheduled in the afternoon. For example, the next meeting, we do have another meeting here starting at one o'clock. So who knows what schedule is, but you, I wouldn't suggest we go by noon anyway. No, why, why don't we try? Why don't we try nine to eleven thirty? Yeah. 
see how that works. We may find it's pretty heavy slogging and uh, it's a long time or, or perversely we're still engaged and want to push on a bit. Your eyes so let's, so let's try that. Is that fair? That's totally fair. And the next meeting on the 27th, Councillor McDonald does have an accessibility meeting at one o'clock. So we were going to actually make arrangements for lunch. So does the whole committee want to stay and have some lunch? I just, I, I just didn't I want to order it for one and not all. Well, mm -hmm. there's two of us that are on the accessibility. Yeah. So why don't oh, they, have, yes. why don't they have lunch? I don't. I probably will move on. And, uh, Bruce feels me. Or you could ask us individually later. Okay. Sorry. The thing about it is, you don't have much of an option to leave here and go find something. So, so then we'll just look for a motion to adjourn, please. So, Lord Bill, Mr. Bruce, favor. It's carried. Thank you. I have that. Thank you so much. <laughs>